speaker is uh, Matt Solt, who's going to be telling us about muography, which is the intersection between particle physics and archaeology. All right, thank you. Yep, my name is Matt, and uh, I'm a postdoc at University of Virginia. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to tell you all about uh, muography. So I should start with a disclaimer that I'm not uh, an expert in archaeology um, or even uh, muography. Uh, the, um, my, my connection here is actually, uh, I, I'm nominally a, a dark matter person, and it turns out that uh, the similar dark matter detectors we, we use are very similar to the muon detectors that we also use, which are pretty similar to the ones we use for uh, this concept that we call muography. And uh, the reason I bring this to, to this group is because this is a very interdisciplinary topic, and this is a very interdisciplinary group. So I want to make this, uh, this idea, uh, th this group aware of this idea, um, so that hopefully we can further these, these applications of, of muography. Great. All right, so the story sort of begins uh, in 2017, just six years ago. Uh, the Scan Pyramid collaboration claimed a discovery of a big void within the Great Pyramid. And they, are, they were able to do this through a concept called cosmic ray muography, which I'll explain in a little bit. But basically, uh, this uses cosmic rays that come from the upper atmosphere that penetrate uh, uh, deep structures. And you can actually detect these muons uh, at the surface and draw conclusions about uh, the interior of, of a pyramid or really any structure. So this actually has a much deeper uh, history. Actually, the first attempt of imaging uh, pyramids with myography started with Louis Alvarez in 1970. Uh, he's actually a Nobel laureate and was uh, also related in, in to the Manhattan Project. I mentioned that because there's, of course, a renewed interest uh, in that recently. And he actually imaged the second largest pyramid. He didn't do the Great Pyramid. And he found no unexpected voids. Um, and then, as I just mentioned, in 2017, this Scan Pyramid Project uh, claimed to discover this this grand gallery. And because of this, uh, because this was such an interesting find, the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities requested a, a proposal for a follow-up study. And uh, the follow-up study is called the Explore the Grand Pyramid Project, or EGP. And that's uh, what I'll build up to in this talk. So uh, some quick details about this Great Pyramid, for those uh, who don't know. Uh, it was basically built in the 26th century BC. It was 147 meters high when it was built. Um, however, it shrank a little bit. And it remained the, the tallest building for several millennia until 1311. It's made of, up of about 2.5 million blocks that are uh, one cubic meter uh, in, in size each. It's made up of mostly limestone with some granite. And of course, there's many open questions uh, to, to this pyramid, specifically what is the full internal structure um, because nowadays when you uh, want to probe the internal structure of a pyramid, it's frowned upon to just use dynamite like they used to do back in the day. Um, there's also questions in, in how it was built, um, uh, or even if humans built it. So uh, these, these are open questions uh, for, for this type of project. Um, okay, so we'll build up to there, and I think we'll, we'll take a major step back um, for, for a general audience, and first, I'll tell you what, uh, what a muon is, and then I'll tell you a lot more information than you wanted to know about muons uh, before we get to how we actually use them to image. So we're pretty much all familiar with the periodic table, which has all the elements, and each element has its own atom, like this. Uh, and an atom is basically a, a positively charged nucleus surrounded by electrons. And each nuclei is made up of a series of protons and neutrons. Now this is the point at which chemistry classes stop and particle physics uh, sort of begins. Uh, it turns out it's been known for some time that protons and neutrons are made up of more fundamental particles called quarks. Um, and that leads to the standard model of particle physics, which uh, classifies all the known particles here. And really the periodic table or, or all, all elements are made up of uh, three main fundamental particles, basically the up quark, the down quark, and the electron. But in particle physics, we know that there's a lot more particles, and one of the particles is a muon. Um, so muons were discovered in 1936 from cosmic rays, which I'll explain in a bit, 
And the discovery was so shocking that at the time, a Nobel laureate famously said, who ordered that? Um, muons are second generation elementary particles. So this is the first generation here, second generation here, and third generation here. Uh, they're a part of the standard model, as I said, but they're actually not a part of the periodic table. So they don't, uh, they're not involved in making up elements. But because they're basically a second generation electron, they're effectively, they effectively behave just like an electron, but they have 200 times uh, the mass. And the last important uh, feature of a muon is that they're actually not stable. Uh, typically, second and third generation particles are not stable. They decay down to first generation particles, which uh, in the correct combination are in fact stable. And in fact, they only last about 2.2 millionths of a second uh, on average. So because of that, you can't just stumble upon a pile of muons and be able to, and expect to be able to use them for study. Uh, but they do have to come from somewhere. And where do they come from? Well, it turns out you can uh, produce them through particle collisions. And there's two main sources. The first are cosmic rays. Um, basically, there's a bunch of particles uh, coming from space, either the sun or uh, more violent stellar activity like supernova, that collide in the upper atmosphere. And this creates a shower of exotic particles, such as pions and kaons, which are another class of particles. And uh, these also don't survive. They decay to other particles like electrons, neutrinos, and uh, muons. And these muons uh, last just long enough that many of them reach uh, Earth's surface, as shown here. You can also produce muon at particle accelerators, uh, basically, uh, uh, producing collisions from, say, in this example, protons on some target, which also produces the same secondary particles, which decay to muons, that you can use in study for particle physics experiments. And as an example here, I show the Fermilab uh, muon campus, which if you were at the ASA conference a few years ago, um, some of you may have taken the Fermilab tour and actually seen the muon campus from, from above uh, Wilson Hall. Basically, they produce muons and send these muons to different uh, experiments uh, for, for study of fundamental physics. Um, so a few more details about muons. Uh, besides their discovery, muons are used as a tool for discovery themselves in the field of, part in the field of particle physics. So I, I mentioned the muon campus previously. This, these are basically the two experiments there. The first one on the left is the famous Fermilab muon G minus two experiment. Uh, basically, what they do is measure the wobble of a muon. So muons have an intris intrinsic wobble. And you can also calculate this wobble. And it turns out that there's a pretty strong disagreement between experiment and theory at the four sigma deviation. So that sort of implies um, uh, extra particles and forces beyond the standard model. And uh, it turns out in just less than two weeks, uh, the G minus two experiment will release, release their latest results. And I don't have any insider knowledge, but I suspect they might get to five sigma uh, discovery in, in a few weeks. Uh, the second type of experiment uh, looks at muon decays. Um, and this is called the mu to e experiment. Basically, what they do is they create muons and trap them into atoms and wait for them to decay. And uh, you can actually measure the decay products. And there's certain types of rare decays that aren't allowed by the standard model that if you do measure them, this implies extra particles or forces, um, such as example here, this is uh, what's called a supersymmetric uh, particle. Details are important. The point is that muons can themselves be uh, a tool for, for discovery um, beyond pyramids as well. Unfortunately, muons are also a nuisance for, for many fundamental physics experiments. Um, and I give two examples here. The first are uh, dark matter direct detection experiments, which are extremely sensitive. And basically, they can be overwhelmed uh, by muons um, if, if, if they're done on Earth's surface. So in order to mitigate this, uh, what you have to do is bury these detectors deep uh, a mile underground. And as you'll see, uh, muons are very penetrating particles. So that's why you have to get so uh, deep in the Earth in order to filter out these, these cosmic ray muons. And the second example is uh, what I work on. Um, this is the cosmic ray veto for the mu to e experiment. So the same experiment as the previous slide. Basically, uh, one of the major backgrounds of this experiment, or something that can fake a signal, 
is exterior muons entering the experimental hull. And you can't really shield that, those besides burying the experiment deep underground, which is quite costly. Um, so what we do is build this cosmic ray veto device and surround much of the experimental hull and track all the muons entering the experimental hull so that we can actually reject them in, in our measurement. And for scale, you can see uh, a person here, so you can kind of see the size of this experiment. So I mentioned this because this is effectively the same type of detector that's gonna be used in the EGP uh, project, as you'll see. All right, so now that I described uh, more than you probably wanted to know about muons, uh, I'll describe uh, how we actually use them for imaging. And I think we're pretty much all familiar with the concept, even if we don't know it. It basically has to do with imaging from absorption which is quite uh, simple. Uh, basically what you need is some particle source, some object of interest that you're interested in, in measuring, and some particle detector. And that object will absorb some particles and let other particles go, go through. And uh, the number of particles it absorbs depends on the size of the object and the density of the object. So uh, making that measurement gives you an idea of that. And we're all familiar with this from uh, medical applications, mainly uh, an X-ray. Uh, source, uh, where um, you have an x-ray here, which is basically just a mini particle accelerator that shoots x-rays at a person. Bones are more dense, of course, so they'll absorb more x-rays. Tissue is less dense, they'll transmit more x-rays, and you can have a detector below or some sort of film, and you can actually see the internal structure of a human being based on this mechanism. It's the exact same concept with what we call muography, where we use muons uh, to actually image um, uh, internal structure. Uh, so this is a good example I found uh, on the web here. So basically there's this water tower, and uh, the question this paper poses is which image, in which image does the, wa uh, does the water tower actually contain water? So basically what you do is you aim a muon telescope at this uh, water tower, and uh, on, on this picture here, yellow means you observe more muons and blue means you observe less muons. Um, so first you can actually see the, the structure of the tower itself because the tower is made up of uh, concrete and will of course absorb some muons. And second, you can actually see in, in this picture here that uh, this tower contains water because water is gonna absorb more muons than the case uh, where the tower is empty. So this is a, a clear application of using muons via absorption to actually measure the internal structure of something uh, quite dense. So you might be wondering for this process, why do we use muons? Why not uh, any of the other particles I previously showed? So it turns out muons have unique properties that uh, make them ideal for uh, this type of imaging. One, they can penetrate deeply into matter. Uh, for example, here, I, I mentioned previously that they're producing cosmic rays, but there's a lot of other particles produced in, in these cosmic rays, uh, neutrons, electrons, gammas, uh, uh, et cetera. So typically those are absorbed in the atmosphere, and uh, they would also be absorbed in uh, some object of interest, say a pyramid, pretty quickly, because they're not very penetrative. Uh, however, muons and another particle called uh, neutrinos can actually penetrate deeply through structure. But why can't you use a particle called neutrinos? Well, it turns out uh, they're electrically neutral and they very, very rarely interact with matter. So most neutrinos actually go right through the earth and uh, don't interact with anything at all. Muons, however, have an electric, have an electric charge, much like uh, electrons. And when they pass through matter, they leave uh, just enough energy that they can easily be detected. So uh, muons have uh, this, these unique properties where they can both penetrate through matter and leave uh, a trail so that they can actually be detected. And third, uh, they're also non-invasive. Um, uh, and this is important uh, because uh, typically the objects of interest, you don't wanna uh, um, ruin their internal structure. Um, and it's non-invasive because it uses the naturally occurring muons um, in, in the upper atmosphere. And so the basic principle of this pyramid measurement that I began my talk with is these cosmic ray muons uh, coming from the atmosphere penetrate deeply into this pyramid and you have some sort of muon detector below and uh, you measure the absorption 
And what they observed is less absorption than they expected, which uh, the conclusion from that is that there's something, there's a hidden chamber, there's some empty space uh, there. So this talk is gonna uh, focus on um, absorption, but I just want, really wanna uh, quickly mention another type of muon imaging that involves scattering. So basically, uh, muons, when they go through matter, they, they scatter. And the more matter they go through, the more they scatter. So if you can measure the scattering angle, you can actually, uh, with higher resolution, tell more about this internal structure than simply just absorption. An example here is of uh, nuclear waste, because uh, uranium is quite dense. Uh, but the drawback of this type of uh, imaging is that you have to have two detectors, both on either side, and you have to be able to uh, tell a single muon that goes through um, these detectors. All right, so now that we have a basic uh, understanding of muography and how to use muons for imaging, I wanna touch on the really broad applications of, of muography um, that are summarized in this picture here. So I mentioned the pyramids, but really any historical building uh, can, be, can be imaged. Uh, this has been applied to geological processes like, uh, or objects like volcanoes and glaciers, which are also very dense objects that require something like a muon to, to penetrate uh, through. It's all, uh, other geological applications uh, are, are used for um, mineral exploration and uh, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and there's also infrastructure applications for bridges and, and dams. Um, there's applications to nuclear reactors, and this was actually applied uh, to the uh, Fukushima disaster. Uh, muography was used to actually tell where the nuclear core uh, of that uh, reactor was, um, because uh, uranium is quite dense, uh, it, it leaves a very clear signal. Uh, it can also be applied to uh, carbon storage. Uh, basically, if you collect carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in the ground, you want to make sure that it stays there, and mu muography can be used to, to uh, detect that. And the last thing I'm going to mention is cargo scanning from ships uh, for national security. Um, if you're interested in seeing if a ship has some nuclear material that they're not supposed to, you can uh, use muography for that. And uh, this has been realized uh, in a small part within the private sector as well. And I have a non-inclusive list of uh, private companies that I'm not whatever uh, whatsoever affiliated with. Um, and so there's a list of companies here and uh, their, their applications that they use uh, there as well. Right. All right, so I mentioned uh, the applications of myography. Now, how do we actually detect the muons um, themselves? And as I mentioned earlier, muons have um, a charge. And when a charged particle moves through matter, it ionizes it, and this can be detected. And there are several different types of muon detectors that can exploit this uh, mechanism. And for interest of time, I think I'll just uh, mention the, these last two here. So here's what we call a scintillator. Basically, when a charged particle or muon goes through, uh, it ionizes, and this produces photons. Uh, like this, and you can have a photo detector that detects those photons and you can tell when a charged particle traverses uh, this, this medium here. So a photo detector is a fancy word for, for a camera. And the one on the right is sort of a more, slightly more complicated case of the one in the middle. Um, it, uh, basically this is the same thing with a scintillator on the outside, but this is embedded with what we call a wavelength shifting fiber, um, which basically picks up the light and traps the light and sends the light out towards the ends, which can also be picked up by some photo detector. Uh, and I mentioned this technology specifically because this is what we're gonna use for the EGP um, measurements. All right, so at the University of Virginia, we actually build these counters, or as we call them counters, these scintillators with wavelength, wavelength shifting fibers. And I just wanna real quickly show you some uh, pictures of what that looks like. So this is a cross-section of one of these scintillators that uh, I showed previously, uh, these guys, which come from uh, Fermilab's NICAT facility. And these, are, uh, these come extruded with holes in them, and that's so that you can put these wavelength shifting fibers in, and this is a picture of, of what these fibers look like in a spool. 
And what we do with these uh, simulators is sort of glue them together into these, what we call die counters that look something like this. Um, and these are the sort of fundamental units for what these detectors look like. Uh, now these are for the Midu East uh, cosmic ray veto I mentioned previously. Uh, and this, this same idea is gonna be used for EGP. The only exception, and this is a bit more technical, is that we're gonna use these triangular shaped counters, which actually produce, uh, improves the, the hit resolution. And I like this picture down here because this is, uh, this shows actually these wavelength shifting fibers, they kind of glow green. So basically when a muon passes through one of these uh, scintillators, there's a flash of green light. And this flash of green light can be picked up by these guys here on the left, basically uh, silk, what we call a silicon photomultiplier, which is sort of a fancy uh, CCD that, that you have in your camera that can pick up this light and see a muon uh, going through a detector. Okay, and the last thing I'll show on, on this part is um, this, these are one of our uh, fully formed, what we call modules for the MUDUE CRV. And here's an example of an actual event in, in our test stand where a muon traverses this uh, detector and it lights up as shown here in blue and you can actually compute uh, where a muon travels through this, this type of detector. All right, so now that we have a basic understanding of how muon detection works, let's uh, uh, turn our attention towards the actual EGP projects or exploring the Great Pyramid project. Um, so this project will scan the entire uh, interior of the Great Pyramid using cosmic ray uh, vetoes, or sorry, cosmic ray muons. And uh, these will use much larger detectors than the scan pyramid project that I showed at the beginning of my talk and with much greater precision. And this will uh, enable the creation of a detailed 3D image of the entire internal structure of, of the, the pyramid in about uh, two years time. So how the detectors look uh, is shown up here in the upper right. So basically there's, there are these cargo containers and uh, you have these scintillating bars here, uh, vertical in this direction, horizontal in this direction. And you have eight in a single array. So you can actually track muons that go through these detectors that uh, have gone through the pyramid. And these eight uh, uh, containers will be moved around this pyramid every few months. And uh, it'll take about two years for these detectors to go all the way around the pyramid uh, so that you can compute an actual topographical image of, of what's inside the pyramid. Um, so it's not built yet, but we do have some preliminary simulations. Um, and I'll show you what these look like. So on the left is some assumed internal structure of, of the pyramid. So we have what's known, uh, the King's Chamber, the Grand Gallery, and the Queen's Chamber. Uh, we have simulated the, the supposed uh, big void that was discovered here. And then there's been hints of a hypothetical second King's Chamber uh, all the way up at the top. And you can see uh, simulation results here. You can clearly see from, from these muons where these uh, voids are in, in the pyramid uh, shown in, in this bright yellow. And I will say this is a very preliminary simulation. There's a lot that can be improved with these uh, topographic algorithms to construct even higher resolution uh, images. So this, the status of this project is the detector design is in fact finalized. It's uh, what I showed here, these triangular counters. Um, these uh, uh, counters have been actually tested in a Fermilab test beam facility and these pre preliminary simulations have been run. And so we're effectively ready to start building and hopefully taking data uh, pretty soon, although there's no clear timeline at the, at, at the moment, but we do, we do have funding for it. Uh, in addition, we're gonna do something similar to the uh, El Casillo in uh, Temple at uh, Chichen Itza, which will also be imaged using this method and very similar muon detectors. The only real difference is that this detector can actually be placed inside the uh, pyramid because there's, there's access there. And similar questions that EGP can answer will also be answered uh, with this project. All right, so the last thing I wanna mention before I close is um, some things to consider when applying muography. So I uh, brought this to the group because uh, this is, as you can see, very interdisciplinary and a lot of people aren't aware of this and it's very under, underutilized. 
So there's many potential applications that are relevant to topics of interest in the ASA, um, even directly from EGP. Uh, Egyptology does have some biblical implications, obviously. But this can also be applied to geology, uh, other forms of archaeology, and uh, either even environmental questions. Because um, really, uh, all you need is some sort of structure of interest. You need your cosmic ray muons, which are naturally produced, and you need um, some sort of muon detector that can potentially detect these uh, cosmic rays. So when considering how to apply this, uh, how to apply muography, I found a really nice paper uh, that's mostly focused on geological questions that have nine questions to consider before using this, this process. And I won't go over all these in the interest of time. Uh, the, the main ones I want to focus on are uh, the major bottleneck, which I think is the technological accessibility. Uh, unfortunately, you do, you do need um, the physics expertise of these detectors in order to, to get this measurement to work. And the, the demand for, for this expertise uh, outweighs the, the uh, supply in this case. Um, and uh, yes, there's several other things to, to consider as well. Uh, one, one thing I don't see here in these nine questions, it, which is of course always important to consider, is funding and, and money. So who, who is gonna, gonna pay for, for, for this, these types of measurements? Anyway, so I'll, I'll wrap up. So since their surprising discovery in 1936, muons have themselves been used as a tool for discovery. So uh, uh, in addition to that, muons um, uh, can be used in a process that we call muography that can be used to image dense and thick objects. And there's a very broad application to, to muography. And these applications have actually existed for several decades, even, uh, even though these are relatively smaller scale experiments. And despite the broad applications, Geography is currently underutilized as a technique in a variety of fields, uh, which leaves plenty of opportunity for future applications that span many uh, disciplines. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and be happy to take some questions this time. Yeah, so thanks for your talk. Um, Louis Alvarez was, was one of my mentors, and I remember him talking about trying this, and his resolution was not very good, right. spatial resolution. But I vaguely remember that they had tried acoustic measurements of the pyramid, looking at uh, reflections from sound waves. And um, I don't remember the pros and cons. Would you happen to know? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I've heard rumors of other methods to try and image the pyramid. And there's definitely, uh, as listed here, uh, synergies that you can do with other types of measurements like that um, to, to see if they're in agreement or disagreement. Uh, I don't know the details of uh, the pros and cons of, of that mechanism. Hey, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, quick question, are there any hypotheses on what the alien, I mean the Egyptians might have uh, created the extra chambers for? Uh, that's a good question. So yeah, I'm, I'm not an archeologist, so I don't know. So there's yeah debates within the community uh, about what that can mean. And I don't, I, I think they're far from, that, that's far from being settled. In addition, not everyone's convinced that they actually found a hidden chamber there. Um, so there's actually debate on, on that as well. Um, but this, this uh, experiment should be able to at least definitively tell what the internal structure is for structures that are at least three meters large. In terms of, yeah, why the Egyptians would do that, I think it's just historical speculation. Yeah. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. If you have a void in the middle of that pyramid structure and you have these cosmic rays coming from the top, they're going to hit limestone at the top and then limestone at the bottom, right? How come they don't get absorbed in those sections and kind of just get black at the end on the detectors? How, how yeah. do you get through those sections that are dense as well? So some do get absorbed and some get transmitted. And there's a probability here. Um, and the probability is related to the density of the material and how much uh, goes through. So yeah, when it goes through the limestone, some muons get absorbed um, and some transmit all the way through, but when it hits that empty space, all those muons go through. So there's sort of this loss of material there and you can detect that loss of material by observing more muons than you expect given the hypothesis that all that should be limestone, essential. essential. So uh, I'd like to use my 
uh, privileges chair task, this, it seems that would, would be of greatest interest to this group and many other people is using this method to uh, in and around the Jerusalem area to discern things like Solomon's temple and that kind of thing. Is there any discussion of that? I, I haven't seen any in the field. So that's yeah, one of the reasons why I bring it to this group. I think it could be quite useful in that regard. Um, yeah, so in, in, in terms of applications, yeah, all you need is just a muon detector, but you have to have a way to get that muon detector underneath uh, the object of interest. Um, yeah, you'd have to get it to yeah. go through, but right. that would certainly be of great interest. Right. Anyway, uh, let's thank Matt again for what I think <laughs> is the most elaborate pyramid scheme I've ever heard of. <laughs>